Oh, thank you. Hi, and welcome to the Virginia Farmers Market Association's webinar, Farmers Market Liability. I'm Kim Hutchinson, I'm the Executive Director with the Virginia Farmers Market Association. We're very pleased to have Rico Mesroth of Farmers Insurance Financial Services presenting. Rico is a multi-year financial contributor to VAFMA and has been very helpful to our members on insurance-related issues. We hear insurance-related questions from our members every week, so we know this would be a popular topic. We also knew that Rico was the one to lead this discussion. Rico insures many different types of businesses throughout the nine states on the East Coast, and today he'll be focusing on the risks faced by farmers markets and vendors. I'll now turn the webinar over to him. Rico? Great. Hey, thank you very much uh, for that. And, uh, and nine states in the District of Columbia, so I think I might have, uh, you know, 10 states at some point. I probably should correct that. Anyway, <laughs> welcome, folks. Um, my name is Rico Messeroth. I'm a multi-line agent in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I've got uh, 40 years experience um, in the business and I've, uh, it's kind of like the farmers commercially see on TV where they talk about all sorts of weird claims. Um, we know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. Uh, and what I'm seeing in the last five years in particular is uh, lawsuits just keep going up. Um, there's a tremendous uh, transfer of wealth going on in this country via lawsuits, and it's, uh, it's getting worse. So one of the things that I do is provide, uh, you know, advice to all the small businesses and even homeowners um, uh, that, uh, that I insure, as, as well as their, um, you know, financial planning as well, too. So just to give you an example of how ridiculous lawsuits get, this is a personal lines lawsuit, but we had one client who had a birthday party um, for a bunch of 12 year olds and one of the 12 year old uh, children fell off a trampoline um, and, uh, you know, scraped their back a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the, the host parents um, asked if he was okay and he said, fine, he got right back up and jumped on the trampoline. Well, that evening on a Sunday night, um, they, uh, the, the parents of that child said they were going to be suing. Um, my uh, my client uh, emailed me as well, Sunday night, saying, "Well, please check out this email from my former best friend. You know, please advise me as, uh, you know, what um, what I should be doing in cases like this." So, just an example. It, it doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, but people are doing it all the time. And um, for you folks, it's just important to have the proper amount of protection. Because let me throw this out right away: um, when you when you're buying liability insurance, it's not just the liability uh, protection, the indemnity that you're getting, you're also getting um, uh, a corporate attorney that represents you in these things too. So, all right. All right, so, um, you know, I'm located here in, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, um, and we've got uh, five licensed people that can help you out uh, if you have any questions on that. Um, here in the agency, we grow and protect assets of our families and small businesses licensed in those 10 states, including the, D the District of Columbia, provide auto home business and life, retirement savings plans, IRAs, 401ks, and annuities. Um, and just a note on that, um, one of the things I do for small businesses, um, if you have just one employee, you can set up what's called a simple IRA, which is a 401k for small businesses. And there's a lot more flexibility um, rather than the 401ks, plus the 401ks are, you know, meant really for 100 employees or more and have fees associated with them. Um, simple IRAs have the flexibility where you can um, deduct not only your contributions, but those of your employees, uh, you know, that you're contributing to them. You don't have to contribute every year. Uh, it's flexible as to what you want to contribute based on your, um, you know, business results for that year. Um, again, we're in a very litigious society. Um, you know, small businesses are being sued for libel and slander. Um, you know, one of the things I'm seeing too is that uh, it's amazing how many people record conversations um, and uh, keep it, you know, different states are different regulations on that. Virginia is a, is a one uh, person state. So, you know, as long as they're recording you, it's, um, it's legal. They don't need your approval of them recording you. So I've, I've seen lawsuits um, where you, you might be having lunch with somebody um, and all of a sudden that recording ends up in court. It's, it's, it's a really sad commentary on today's society, but so I'm just saying there, 
please be very careful. Um, if you can have a business meeting and they get the phone out on the table, you know, please ask them to turn it off. I, I can't uh, emphasize that enough. Slip and fall is a very common type of lawsuit. Um, and that could be at your home, at your business. Uh, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but uh, the vendors themselves, the farmer's market, uh, you know, operators. Um, you know, I, I go, I have a favorite farmer's market that I attend every, on Saturday mornings here in Richmond. And um, yeah, I'm always very conscious about, uh, you know, they have some holes, frankly, you know, just where the line goes down a little bit. And I can see somebody turning an ankle and all of a sudden they blame the operator. Um, by the way, the, the, on that note, where, if you're operating it in this particular case, it's a grassy area that's part of a mall, um, make sure you get the liability um, insurance certificate from the owner of the mall or owner of the property. Um, and it just, you know, this one just came up in the news again yesterday that kind of started this whole thing, but the famous McDonald's hot coffee lawsuit back in the late 80s, um, where the person burned themselves on the, uh, you know, the coffee that was too hot uh, and won a lawsuit. Um, and then keep in mind, social media spreads bad news very quickly. Uh, you know, as a, as a fellow small business owner myself, I'm always monitoring, um, you know, what people are saying in social media. And, and uh, you might want to, as small business owners, have your customers that are happy, you know, post something for you online um, so that it can, uh, you know, truly show the type of uh, quality business that you're running. Um, all right, so uh, I'm sorry, was there a question there? No, okay. So these are some, some typical um, exposures. Uh, and I remember talking to Kim about this a couple of weeks ago, but here's just five examples. You know, a shopper falls down, gets injured while visiting the market. You know, maybe they, you know, they trip over the tent, you know, line you know, the, you know, the rope that's holding down the tent, uh, they end up suing the, the vendor of that, who owns that farm, and then they sue the operator. In fact, they can even sue the owner of the property. Um, uh, the vendor's product makes an attendee sick, gets injured. You know, these farmers markets, it's not just uh, food, right? It's, you have uh, folks that are there as uh, jewelers and all sorts of artisan and craftsmen. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, people will sue over the slightest little thing. And so every single vendor should carry liability coverage. And I'll get to that in a moment. Every single operator should make sure that the vendor is carrying liability coverage. Here's an example. Um, and I think I have to give Kim uh, credit for this one. She mentioned this the other day, but you know, it's a windy, it's a windy day. The vendor's tent blows over, injures a guest or blows across the parking lot and starts damaging cars. Um, you know, that vendor better have general liability coverage and then the, the farmer's market operator should have it as well. Um, you know, they could all of a sudden sue the operator for saying, hey, you didn't, you didn't check to make sure that all of the vendor's tents were, were properly uh, fastened. Um, the vendor feels the operator didn't comply with the contract. Uh, you know, want to make sure that you have contracts between vendor and, and the market operator. Um, and then that way you have it in writing so that uh, both parties are in compliance with the agreement. Um, and then I've seen this happen too, that uh, you know, the county uh, decides to step in and, and maybe they sue for health, health uh, you know, regulations, something like that. So these are just five, five areas that I've seen um, in this particular uh, type of business. Um, so very important, um, you know, what insurance is recommended by both vendors and operators and it's equally important to purchase enough insurance. I've seen people, um, you know, cheap out for a couple of hundred dollars a year and buy minimum limits. And uh, it's just not smart. Um, you know, you should never buy a general liability policy for less than 1 million per occurrence. Um, in other words, 1 million per claim and then 2 million um, annual aggregate. Some people call that one slash two mil. Uh, and what that is referring to is that in any one year, you could have up to a million dollars per claim. You could have two claims that add up to a million dollars and you still have coverage. You could have a whole bunch of small claims. Uh, the annual aggregate limit for that policy is $2 million. The, the maximum amount per claim is $1 million. 
workers' compensation, I always recommend, and by the way, that's, that varies by state as to whether or not you're required to carry it. Um, I, would, I would recommend that if you have even one employee, I would carry it. I was talking to one of my small business owners yesterday who does uh, uh, welding and metal fabrication, and he's been, do he's been doing enough work on his own for many years. He never purchased it, but um, his wife called me yesterday and said, you know what, we've got another another uh, part-time worker. He had the, the guy up on a scaffold. We need workers' comp. And I said, absolutely, you do. Um, so a 500,000 CSL policy for workers' comp, um, CSL stands for Combined Single Limit. You'll see that sometimes on um, auto insurance as well in, in different states. Um, so that means any and all claims. And that's what I recommend. So, uh, you know, essentially what you're covering is the injury to the worker while in, you know, in, you know while in activities um, that uh, take place during his work or his occupation there, okay? So that could include, uh, you know, somebody getting sick, um, somebody catching um, a virus, uh, you know, while they're on the job. Um, it could, uh, somebody falling off a ladder. Um, you know, one of my more, uh, you know, comedic uh, claims, I guess I'll put it, is that, you know, I insure a very large tire and auto center and they had somebody, um, if you can picture this, when they take a tire off the car and then they put this on this machine, um, you know, in, within the body shop or the, the car repair center, and, and it takes the tire off the rim. Well, to knock it off the rim after the air is gone, you know, you take a rubber mallet, you knock it off. Well, this is a rookie worker, uh, brand new. Not all the air was out of the tire before he started knocking off the rim. And um, the rubber mallet bounced off the tire, hit him in the forehead. Um, that is a workers' compensation claim. His name's TJ. Thank goodness he's fine. Um, you know, we're here to joke about this all these years later, but uh, he was taken, you know, to the emergency room and we took care of him that day. Um, uh, so directors and officers liability coverage. Uh, the, this is also known as D&O. Um, depending on how your business or your, your organization is set up, um, it's important that um, you have directors and officers liability uh, because that covers, in a nutshell, the decisions that are made by that board. Um, I have on my desk, um, you know, homeowners association that we're, we're providing coverage for here in Richmond, um, and uh, they have D&O coverage on that because there are uh, four board members among the 16 unit owners, and they they decide things like how much insurance to buy. Um, you know, or uh, you know, they decide things on what what's going to be the makeup of the contract. It's a take it, you know, let's say it's a homeowners or a uh, farmers market association. What's the wording of the contract going to be? Things like that. Um, I've been on several nonprofits um, in the past. Uh, March of Dimes, uh, you know, Children's Health Improvement Project here in Virginia, um, and uh, believe me, all of us had DNO liability coverage for those organizations. Um, and then finally, business auto, that can either be covered by, if you have, um, you know, business autos that are titled in the name of your business or a GL policy up above can add what's called um, hired non-owned coverage. And those two things provide coverage for, let's say you rent a car in the name of the, um, the business or in the course of that business, or um, one of your employees is driving their own personal car um, while on company business. Those two things will cover those. And you don't have to have business auto for that. Those two items can also be included in general liability protection. All right, so let me, let me go back here. Are there any questions right now before I talk about um, insurance certificates? Okay, um, so here's what the market operators themselves uh, need to insist upon. Oh, Every there, vendor. Rico, no, I'm ahead. sorry. There is a question down in the chat box. Um, is there a standard for how much weight should be on a tent to be considered sufficient? So if someone does sue, it's not considered negligence by not having enough weight. 
You know what? That's an excellent question, and I would refer to the owner owner's manual of the tent because the owner's manual is also part of that contract that you purchased the tent from, right? You're you're also buying that advice um, of how to use the product. That's why you'll have uh, stickers sometimes on these things um, that you purchase. Uh, you know, do not do this or do not do this. So I would refer to the owner's manual and they'll tell you how much weight uh, to put on all four corners of the tent. That's great. Um, anybody, if you have questions, you can use the chat box down, um, well, on my screen. It's on the bump below. It's a little chat bubble. Um, or you can unmute yourself. Or if you're having trouble unmuting yourself, um, uh, let me know. Um, you can either send a note privately through chat or raise your hand, and I'll unmute um, unmute your line. Thank you. Okay. Hi, so, and, Rico. Uh, yeah, I have a quick ahead. question. Um, could you explain the difference between if a vendor has a farm liability policy versus a commercial general liability policy and which, uh, what each one covers? Sure. So if somebody has a, a farm liability policy, um, you know, it, it most likely has general liability coverage in it. Um, so, uh, you know, farm liability policy will include your liability on premises, you know, at the, on the farm, somebody comes to visit the farm, slip and fall down, or, or maybe the farm has a contract with somebody, there's a dispute over the contract, um, and, uh, you know, the general liability portion of that farm liability policy would cover that. Um, it probably has food spoilage coverage in there, as well as, uh, you know, off-premises liability. So if somebody has a farm liability policy, and, and they're all different, um, but I would, I would uh, venture to say that they've got, uh, first of all, kudos to them for having it. And secondly, I think they'll, they'll be in good shape um, with that policy. Yeah, I think we, we found out that one of our vendors has a farm policy, but their insurance company told me they, a general liability um, policy is not included. And that's what we're, you're okay. suggesting okay. that all vendors have, right? Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, perhaps the farm liability is strictly something that covers their their um, their harvest, right? I, you know, it, as I said, they're all a little bit different. Um, but a GL policy is is if it's not in the farm liability, the general liability coverage, and definitely buy it. Um, you know, one thing I didn't include in the slides, and I, I meant to as I'm listening to this question, is that these policies will generally be between 900 and 1500 a month, I'm sorry, a year. Um, depend, it all depends on the annual income that's being derived by the vendor or the operator. So, um, you know, if it's a hundred dollars a month, I think that's a very small price to pay, you know, for being protected. Again, not only the liability purposes, but having that uh, company attorney um, walk you through the, the, the process of being sued. We have okay, another. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we have another question yeah, sure. from Go the ahead. chat. Uh, when he gets to COIs, his advice on getting additional insured on liquor liability from alcohol producers. Why is it not considered standard practice? Uh, repeat that again about the liquor liability. Uh, advice on getting additional insured on liquor liability from alcohol producers. Why is it not considered standard practice? I, I, if I were insuring somebody and they were, they were, provi they were selling that product, um, I would have them put, add it to the policy. That is not a standard part of a general liability policy. That's a rider um, that has to be placed on it. And very often, because I insure restaurants too, uh, there are some, some companies who refuse to offer liquor liability. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question or not, but um, again, if I were insuring somebody who sells alcohol, um, I would absolutely make sure they have liquor liability coverage. Great. Because um, that brings in a whole host of other exposures. Somebody buys your product, you know, they drink it on premises, and then, uh, you know, an hour later, they cause a traffic accident and kill somebody because the driver's been impaired, impaired because he purchased the alcohol product. 
All right. Um, speaking of that, you know, an Accord 25 certificate, that lists all of your policies. Accord is just a company that for the last 40 years has provided, uh, um, you know, generic forms that are, you know, industry approved. And you can just Google Accord and see, you know, all sorts of types of uh, different um, applications, certificates, et cetera. Um, that lists all of the policies, the companies, and the policy limits um, that are on there. Uh, the, ven the vendor entity name. So again, I'm speaking from the premise, you know, uh, of of being an operator. Um, the vendor entity name should be listed as additional insured uh, and certificate holder on the certificate. So uh, it's one thing to be a certificate holder, but you have a higher level of uh, response coming out of the policy if you're also listed as an additional insured. In other words, you participate um, from the coverage of that policy. Um, and uh, nine times out of 10, it doesn't cost anything from the policy owner to add an additional insured, or maybe some companies might limit you to three before they might start charging you $100 for, say, a fourth additional insured. But I'm talking about, you know, pretty sizable you know, corporate entities. Um, who have the big policies and much more exposure. All right, all vendors, including nonprofits, really need to have insurance. Um, you know, just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean you're not going to get sued. All right, any other questions about the certificate? Um, well, we have one about workers' comp insurance. Would you? We have a couple more. Would you like to wait until you go through the, you know, your your next couple slides and then take questions, or do you um, want to just? Keep taking them. No, no, that was good. That was good. Um, so, what's the question on work comp? Um, regarding workers comp, the workers comp carrier does uh, does an annual audit of what you pay your employees. They ask for quarterly figures per what you submitted for your federal tax withholding form. No one told me this, and my federal tax withholding was done per pay period, as instructed by a friend who does payroll, not quarterly. Thus make sure your federal withholding form is done quarterly so you can easily give your figures to the workers comp auditor oh yeah that's so that's a very astute um business owner um so i very well stated there the um so it's called the, the federal irs form is called the 941 and that's a quarterly um uh report that's what that's what the workers compensation uh, companies want and uh it is based on payroll um, and they do do audits once a year. So for example, um, again, with this, uh, you know, the metal fabricator that I was talking to yesterday, um, you know, if there are different classifications for different types of businesses, right? And if you have the wrong classification uh, to just get a cheaper premium, the uh, work comp uh, insurance company auditor not only asks for the payroll, but asks for a breakdown of different uh, duties within the company. Uh, give an example, again, that Tyron Auto Center I referred to before, they have uh, you know 12 tow trucks, they have, I think, eight uh, people who are driving the tow trucks, they have some clerical staff, and then they have people who they describe as turning wrenches. Um, so, you know, all of those different types of job duties have different layers of exposure. And you can imagine if somebody's just in the front office running paperwork does not have the same liability exposure as somebody who's going out there and uh, driving tow trucks, right? Um, so, you know, every work comp type of a job duty and type of industry has uh, different rates on it based on the exposure. And by the way, those rates are based um, on a national basis. So metal fabricators will have one rate per thousand of payroll, uh, much different than uh, the generic, I think it's 8331 uh, work comp code, which is somebody working, you know, a clerical job, you know, in, in the front of the store, so to speak. Um, I think there's one other aspect of that. Yeah, so my payroll provider um, does my 941 because she also does my uh, taxes. So, um, but you can also fill out a 941 yourself just based on your payroll data. Um, one difference, there are the general liability policies, 
Uh, for larger entities, I don't expect anybody on this call uh, to run into this, um, but uh, general liability policies will also have insurance company audits, but they rate things based on the amount of revenue coming in, top line revenue versus uh, the payroll for workers' compensation. All right, so it's not net income, it's top line payroll. So if you've got uh, I think of a contractor right now um, that I do up in Fredericksburg, and uh, they've got an annual uh, top line revenue of about 1.5 million. So their GL policy is based on a rate per thousand for that amount, um, but the amount of payroll is only 75,000. So uh, it's, it's got two employees. So you've got so the difference there is work comp rates are based on the amount of payroll and the type of work that's being done. General liability rates are based on the type of business and then the top line revenue. All right, so we talked about the certificates here. We go to the next slide. Um, there's the question slide. <laughs> so looks like we were just a little bit ahead of ourselves. Um, any other questions? Okay, we have one. Um... We require insurance certificates from all vendors, but not for market sponsors. Um, they don't pay a fee to attend or guests like entertainers who perform on a gazebo that's removed from patron traffic or the local land trust or historical society. We, requiring insurance certificates from them would likely affect their participation. Is there any difference in risk or exposure here? I think it's a matter of um, spreading out your protection um, as an operator. So if, if I were, you know, operating a farmer's market, I would again ask for the general liability coverage from the, from the person whose land I'm, I'm running my thing on, um, whether it's a nonprofit, uh, it could be a church, for example, um, or, a, uh, or an owner or a trust for that matter. So, um, I don't, I don't think it would, I mean, if, if they're, first, I was going to say, I don't think it would affect their participation, but, you know, somebody should be advising them to get a general liability policy for, to protect themselves. Um, Leslie asks, uh, we are in Massachusetts and have been advised by an attorney that art artisans are not considered vendors by any definition required by the state. This market has made its own definition for vendors limited to those who sell food products. Are definitions like this for insurance purposes specific to each state and its regulations? Um, and an addendum, the market has its artisans sign a hold harmless agreement and considers them independent contractors. Okay, so I'm smiling here because I'm a, I'm a Bay Stater myself, I'm born and raised in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, so you, you, your, your question has a couple of different parts there. Um, I always advise people to protect themselves. So regardless of what the state regulation is or definition is, um, let's say that I've got, I'm running a, uh, a farmer's market in Quincy, Mass. And uh, they, you know, you've got some uh, artisans there that are, have uh, put together some jewelry or, uh, you know, they, you know, some handmade soaps or something like that. Um, and uh, somebody gets injured, maybe they cut themselves on the jewelry or the handmade soaps, you know, create um, an irritation, an allergic reaction. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, the person who is affected by that, their attorney is going to care what the definition is of an artisan um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I would, anybody who's running or is operating as a vendor in my farmer's market, I insist upon the GL policy being there. Does that answer the question? Bottom line is, you know, if you injure a party, um, an attorney's not going to care what the definition is of a particular type of business, you know, in the, in the state or commonwealth they're in. They're just going to sue you. 
So you might as well insist upon every vendor having that uh, liability coverage. Plus, it's just smarter for them, right? What, why, you know, again, for $100 a month, if that, why wouldn't you want to be protecting yourself for a million dollars per claim, two million per year? Leslie says, um, yes, I guess that it answers um, her question, but it just would okay. eliminate a number of our small artisans because of cost. So I guess, you know, even $100 a month is, is tough for some, some of these very small businesses. Sure, sure. Um, our next question. Um, so in your experience, a farm policy with general liability is sufficient to cover a farm participating at a farmer's market. Some of yes, my vendors- as long as we, Yeah, just make sure that the GL is in, in the contract, you know, in that, in that policy. Um, some of my vendors are being told they must additionally purchase a commercial insurance policy. Does this sound like overkill? Yeah, I don't believe so. And I, I say this in, in the context of, uh, you know, if you want to participate, um, you know, in that market, I guess it depends on, you know, how much you're making out of the thing. But I, I do not believe it's overkill. I, I think it's the operator making sure that they are protecting themselves. Um, if the market has general liability and a vendor without liability gets sued, Will the market be protected or does the market and the vendor need liability in order to protect the market as a whole? So if the vendor doesn't have coverage. Yes. Uh, let's, let's go to, yeah. So let's um, again, go to that soap manufacturer and they end up, um, you know, injuring somebody and then they sue the soap manufacturer, uh, they'd be going after the assets of the person who made the soap, but uh, you know, rest assured, they'd be going after the, the operator right after that. So in the event of a vendor not having that insurance, uh, the operator's insurance should kick in, at least in the case of, um, uh, you know, having an attorney defend you on that. It, what the insurance company would do is, you know, send you a letter of um, uh, rights and, uh, you know, which is just the first step. Okay, we're going to defend you. We're going to see if there's actually coverage uh, while you're being defended. So bottom line, yeah, I'm a small business owner. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough um, having general liability coverage. That's the last question we have so far. Um, if anybody has additional questions, please use the, the chat feature or unmute yourself. Oh, here's one. Um, sponsors and music musicians. Um, I think you covered this, but. You know what, there was, a, there was a, that was part of a question earlier. I don't think I covered that. So oh, okay. um, if they set up a stage um, let's say in your in your market, then um, absolutely, I would make sure that uh, you know they have a general liability policy. If they're singing something and there are lyrics that uh, somebody in the in the uh, audience you know has a disagreement with, you know that that's not going to come back on the operator. Anyone else have questions? All right, well, just a little shout out to my favorite uh, or my fellow Bay Stater out there. Go Red Sox. <laughs> All right, uh, Kim? Oh, wait a minute. I've got to unmute Kim. Sorry. <laughs> That's oh, right. There you are. Thanks. Am I back? Yes. Um, does anybody else have any questions before we finish? No. Oh, oh we've got a couple. Okay. Um, just came okay. We call our insurer with any questions regarding insurance policies. 
Having a great agent is key. <laughs> um, yes, it is. Yeah, because an agent is an advocate, right? And um, one of the things I do in my agency is I call in all claims. I, I train my my clients. I don't care if it's a little uh, fender bender. Call me. You know, you, you're you know you're going to be a little upset when that's happening, and uh, the, the emotions you may not allow you to remember to do everything. So. Um, I, I have all my clients call me and then I'll ask them questions and I'll report the claim for them. Uh, plus I can expedite things for them. Um, and then John says, I am a small farm starting out. I protect to make a few thousand, like 3,000 to 4,000 this year. Is there insurance to cover me? Or I project to make? Uh, yeah, with that, with uh, that small amount, um, of revenue the first time around. Um, I think what I would do is uh, contact a, a local farm bureau agent, you know, um, give them credit. They specialize in those, the really small ones. Um, and who knows, maybe it'll be uh, $50 a month for a small first time farmer. And Suzanne says, thanks for the info. Um, okay, great. Well, thanks for listening. <laughs> Uh, and Ashley asks, our market has an independent contractor as a market manager. Would a commercial GL policy for the market cover the market manager? No, it, it's, um, uh, it's a separate entity. Um, and uh, so every separate entity needs to have its own GL policy. Yeah, Kim, I think um, a couple of weeks ago, you and I were emailing back and forth with somebody from uh, wellness something or other in Northern Virginia, and that was the case there. Right. And John says, thanks for the help, and this info webinar has been great and informative. Okay, good, good. Well, protect yourselves, folks, but don't forget to enjoy what you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, I, thank you all. So Rico's information is available. He is one of the most um, open and accessible vendors that we work with, and he would welcome the opportunity to answer any questions for you guys that you have one-on-one -on -one that didn't come up during the course of this, as well as help you with any of the needs that you may have with your market, from liability to DNO to EPI, EPL, et cetera. So whatever it is that you need, as a vendor or a market or an individual, he is happy to have that conversation with you, no pressure whatsoever. But he will be very um, upfront and forthcoming with what, um, you know, what is involved and the benefits, et cetera. So feel free to reach out to Rico. Um, I'd like to- say just, Yeah, if I could say just one last thing, folks, for, you know, again, as a fellow small business owner, you know, and, and as a financial advisor, I pay a lot of attention to what's going on uh, I have to, uh, you know, in Congress or pending legislation or something like that. Um, and um, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me as an advisor and also, uh, you know, a father and grandfather at this point that, um, you know, young people in particular need to stay even more aggressively for the futures. So, um, you know, put a little bit aside, you know, towards your retirement, because um, I'm not sure what Social Security is going to have you know, down the, down the road. Um, so I just throw it out there as a little piece of advice. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, we, I will be circling back with Rico after this to talk about um, doing an additional webinar on next steps and uh, additional changes that are happening. Um, so make sure that you look forward, look for that information. Um, I'd like to thank Rico, Rico Mesroth with Farmers Insurance um this has been a, a fantastic uh, webinar and i so appreciate the time that you took today to educate all of us for those of you who like learning via webinars um, please join our email list to get notified of all of our upcoming events we have two in march on um, produce safety and food safety we also um, uh, these will cover inspections compliance new regs standards regulations that are coming out uh, so in the state of virginia specifically so please uh, look to our website and sign up for our email list so that you can be on top of this. In addition to webinars, we also will be in Virginia's Blue Ridge region doing an in-person training in Roanoke on March 14th. 
and we will be in the Chesapeake Great Bridge area March 11th doing trainings for market managers, vendors, and farmers. Um, and so we encourage you to join our mailing list and learn more about all of the webinars and in-person trainings that we are doing, specifically targeted to provide you with the tools and resources that you need to be uh, sustainable in your business here in Virginia. So thank you again for joining us. And I uh, welcome any questions that you have or thoughts on future topics that you would like for Vasna to cover. Feel free to reach out to us and let us know. And with that, we will be ending the webinar. Thank you.